Oprah recently released a new special on ABC titled Shame, Blame, and the Weight Loss Revolution. In this special, Oprah not only discusses her recent weight loss process, also discusses the efficacy and safety of different weight loss medications such as Ozempic, Manjaro, and Wagovi. And I think that there is a lot that Oprah really gets right in this special, such as her insistence that being in a larger body size is nothing to do with willpower or motivation, and that weight loss is not as straightforward as simply calories in, calories out. However, there is a lot about this special, including its core message, that I find deeply problematic. And so that is what I want to discuss today. Now, the overall thesis of this special is that being a larger body size is not about willpower or personal choice. Rather, it is a disease. Because obesity can be classified as a disease, people shouldn't be shamed for their body size. And also, it should be managed the same way that any other disease is managed, and that is through medication. So let's dive into that thesis by examining whether or not being in a larger body size really is a disease, and also whether these GLP-1 medications such as Manjaro, Wagovi, and Ozempic actually deliver on the promises that she's presenting in this special. So to start off with, is obesity actually a disease? In the special, they describe the disease of obesity as being one where an individual has a higher weight set point. And they make the specific distinction that people who are able to lose weight successfully through diet and exercise don't have the disease of obesity. It is only people who continue to shift back up into the higher weight set point who have the disease. But the question is, does having this higher set point in and of itself cause harm to the body? If you do not treat or manage the conditions of overweight or obesity, the risks are significant. Increased risks of heart attack, stroke, various types of cancer. If you had high cholesterol, if you had depression, you would treat it. It is conclusively known that the conditions of overweight and obesity are complex chronic disease states. As the Oprah special so heavy-handedly points out, in reality, the risk of being in a larger body size is really just being at a higher risk for certain chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease. What is the actual risk? Using cardiovascular disease as an example, most studies show that the risk of having a cardiac event or mortality from cardiovascular disease basically doubles from the lowest risk weight category to the highest risk weight category. Now this sounds big, but it's important to keep in mind that this is relative risk. This is how much the risk increases. When we talk about absolute risk, what the studies show is that the increase in all-cause mortality goes from 1% for people in the most preferred BMI category to 2% for people in the highest BMI category. And these statistics are very similar for the risk of having a cardiac event in a year. Interestingly, when researchers adjust for high cholesterol and blood pressure, the risk of having a cardiac event for people in the highest BMI category actually gets cut in half. When looking at the risk of developing cardiovascular disease, so not just having a cardiac event, but actually having the disease, risk rates are very similar to all-cause mortality and the risk of having an event. However, many studies show that the relationship between BMI and the likelihood of having cardiovascular disease is a lot less statistically significant. It's actually waist to hip ratio that is more predictive of somebody developing cardiovascular disease. And the reason why waist circumference seems to be more predictive of cardiovascular outcomes than BMI is that it more accurately predicts whether or not somebody is accumulating visceral fat, which is fat deposited around the internal organs. The important thing to know here is that people can have visceral fat accumulation regardless of their size. And it has been suggested that using BMI in order to assess risk of cardiovascular disease may lead to certain people not getting adequate screening and being underdiagnosed for the condition. There's also a population of people who are classified as obese but are actually metabolically healthy. So these are folks who don't have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or have issues with glucose regulation. So what studies show is that people who are obese who don't actually have symptoms of metabolic syndrome, they're actually not at higher risk of dying or having a cardiac event or having any other chronic health condition than somebody in a smaller body size. In fact, they are at lower risk of these complications than somebody in a normal BMI category who does have these metabolic risk factors. So we know that you can be in a larger body size and not have the harms of obesity. To explore this further, the second question is, if you do have evidence of this metabolic dysfunction, can you improve those markers without experiencing weight loss? And the answer to that is yes. For example, exercise has been shown to reduce visceral fat accumulation and improve metabolic function even in the absence of weight loss. In fact, exercise has been shown to be even more effective at improving these metabolic factors than weight loss through calorie restriction alone. Additionally, there are dietary modifications that somebody can make to help improve their blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar regulation, even if they don't lose a pound. And there is even some evidence that you can have weight loss without actually having an improvement in cardiovascular event risk. Taking all of this together, the evidence really does seem to suggest that while yes, maybe there is some association between weight and metabolic dysfunction, they are not nearly as tightly linked as your doctor would like to have you believe. It is possible that for some people, being in a larger body size might be a symptom that is associated with an environment that is leading to metabolic dysfunction, rather than the excess weight being the driver of that dysfunction in and of itself. Just because you're in a larger body size doesn't mean that you're actually going to have diabetes or cardiovascular disease, just like you're not completely safe from those 
those things if you're in a smaller body size. It would make a lot more sense to provide healthcare to people based on their actual metabolic profile rather than trying to pre-treat them for something that they don't maybe actually have. Now, some might be asking, well, if dietary modification and exercise are both things that can help improve metabolic dysfunction, then what is the harm of focusing on weight? Because in order to lose weight, you kind of have to do dietary modification and exercise. And to that, I say that there actually are a lot of harms to targeting weight loss specifically as a method for health improvement. The first and probably least prevalent and least important of the harms is that it can lead to the undertreatment, under screening of people in smaller body sizes. Because there is an assumption by medical professionals that if you are thin, that you are at low risk and therefore testing things like cholesterol and blood sugar are probably not as important until you're much older. A much larger and more widespread harm is the undertreatment of a variety of conditions in people in larger body sizes. So a very common experience for people in this situation is that they will go to their doctor with a medical concern and their doctor, instead of actually addressing and investigating that concern and providing a reasonable treatment, will just tell them to lose weight. And this is very frustrating because first of all, doctors don't really get any training in nutrition or lifestyle medicine for the most part. And studies show that the weight loss advice that many primary care doctors provide is one, not effective, two, not evidence-based, and three, does not reliably result in weight loss. However, when doctors are targeting weight loss, they spend most of consultation time discussing it rather than addressing the reason why the person came in to see the doctor in the first place. This repeated experience often leads to people who are living in larger body size avoiding care. So what typically happens is that even if they have a concern, they will avoid going to the doctor because they don't want to have the same experience they've always had. I avoided going to the doctor because I felt so much shame. And this can lead to the delayed diagnosis of really serious health concerns. And when you catch a concern such as cancer or cardiovascular disease really late, the likelihood that, that person is going to die of that disease goes up. Another risk of targeting weight loss specifically is the risk of somebody developing an eating disorder. One study shows that 37% of adolescents seeking treatment for restrictive eating disorders were at one point classified as overweight or obese. Another study shows that when adolescents engage in weight control behaviors, the likelihood that they are going to be at a larger weight later on in life goes up. It is also more likely that they are going to engage in binging behaviors and other more extreme weight control behaviors such as purging or laxative use. So when you're considering whether or not to treat obesity as a disease, I think you need to take all these factors into account. There is not consistent evidence that being at a larger body size in and of itself is the cause of metabolic dysfunction. There is also evidence that you can improve metabolic function without weight loss. In addition, if you're going to think of obesity as disease, you have to consider how effective management measures are. And the truth is that often in actual practice, the management methods for increased adiposity actually causes potentially more harm than it does good. And the fact that traditional weight management methods have largely been ineffective and can cause their own set of harms is the justification for why Oprah is pushing the idea that we need medical management instead. But before I dive into the efficacy of these GLP-1 medications, I want to dive into the other part of Oprah's thesis, and that is that if obesity is classified as a disease and is understood to be a disease, that it is no longer something that is worthy of shame. It's not one disease. It's many different subtypes of a disease. So it's complex. Quite complex. And that's why it is so wrong to be shaming people because you don't understand the complexity of each person's situation. Yeah. But would classifying fatness as a disease actually reduce stigma? And I would argue that the answer to that is no. And the reason for that is because there are many diseases out there that are actually diseases that have medication protocols that are still stigmatized. Really great example of that is diabetes. I worked in diabetes care for a number of years, and what I can tell you pretty conclusively is that people are often not public with that diagnosis. They don't want people to know. They feel a lot of shame about receiving that diagnosis, whether or not they have diabetes because of lifestyle factors or because of genetics. When I worked in a hospital-based diabetes clinic, they had a running list of every patient who had an A1C over 9, and they called that list of people the naughty nines. Even though diabetes is a disease, even though there is a medical management protocol for the treatment of that disease, the people who receive that diagnosis feel shame around that diagnosis and their medical team will stigmatize or shame them depending on how well they manage it themselves. If fatness was widely understood to be a disease, there is no doubt in my mind that somebody who does not manage it adequately and achieve thinness would not continue to be stigmatized. I would also argue that most of the benefits of weight loss are actually social benefits because when somebody successfully loses weight and achieves thinness, they are no longer stigmatized. And this will be true whether or not obesity is classified as a disease. And I think that this Oprah special really illustrates that quite well. The first woman that Oprah interviews who lost a substantial amount of weight using one of these medications notes that she started to be shamed for her size starting in fifth grade. And at that early age, she started turning to food to help her cope with the pain of feeling so isolated. But her weight really ballooned and led to other health complications 
complications when she experienced multiple tragedies. First was the premature delivery of her son, followed by a prolonged NICU stay, followed by the death of her father. She fell into a depression and really used food as a coping tool. During this time, her weight really started to increase, and along with it came certain health complications. And she knows that the degree of guilt and shame that she felt around this led to further isolation to the point that she didn't even want to leave the house. And her story really makes me wonder, what would her life have been like if she had not consistently been teased, shamed, and isolated for her size her entire life? Would she have felt that she needed to stop engaging in the things that make life good because she was worried that she would continue to be stigmatized? After she started taking the medication and she lost a substantial amount of weight, she notes that people treated her so much better, that people were friendlier to her children. She notes that she had a very emotional experience going into a clothing store and just being able to try on clothes because when she was at a larger body size, that was not possible for her. Oprah also interviews a teenager and her mom, and I think that, that what really stood out to me in the situation is that the child had been shamed for her weight from the time she was a baby and didn't even have teeth. Her mom notes that she had tried multiple diet programs, that her daughter had gone to fat camps, had been to weight clinics. Imagine what it is like to grow up in an environment where your weight is the primary concern of everybody around you, and that everything that you do is in service of getting that weight down. What would that do to your relationship with food? What would that do to your relationship with your body? And when she's finally able to lose weight, she notices that for her, she is really happy that she can finally have friends and then go to parties and go to prom and try out for the cheerleading squad. And it makes me think, what would these kids' life be like if they weren't barred from doing all of those things because of their size? It really feels like the main benefit of weight loss and the driver through which we see these health benefits is really that finally when people conform to a certain body size, they are able to participate in a world that was never built for them and excludes them at every single turn. Imagine how much more enjoyment and social connection you'll get, how much more movement you'll get, how much lower your stress will be, how much less you'd have to rely on coping mechanisms in order to just get through your day if you weren't barred from enjoying all the things that make life good. For many people, weight loss can feel like a prerequisite for living. I don't believe that classifying obesity as a disease is going to fix that. Having said all that, do I feel like having the goal of weight loss is a bad thing necessarily? And to that, I would say no. But everybody gets one life, and if for somebody, being in a thinner body is going to make that one life more enjoyable, I am not here to take that away from anybody. I am also not here to say that having a tool that's going to make that pursuit easier is necessarily a bad thing. But what I also want is for people to have accurate information about the efficacy of these medications so that they really have the information they need to know whether or not it's a good fit for them. So to that point, let's talk about these GLP-1 medications. In the Oprah special, she really paints these as being the holy grail that is going to treat and solve the obesity problem. Everybody that she interviews has had really dramatic weight loss experiences, ranging from 85 pounds to 160 pounds lost. But is that level of weight loss typical, and do these medications actually treat obesity? In the special, Oprah brings on two doctors to discuss the efficacy and the mechanism of action of these medications. It's important to mention that both of these doctors are consultants for the pharmaceutical companies that produce these medications. The doctors are very specific to point out that you can't just take the medication and have this dramatic weight loss. It has to be in conjunction with diet and lifestyle. So what does the diet and lifestyle have to look like in order for this kind of weight loss to be achieved? Now, Oprah gives some clues to this and how this has worked for her. I use it as a tool. Also, combined with hiking three to five miles a day or running, because I have found that in order to balance everything, so it's not just one thing, it's multiple things for me. It's also weight resistance training and all the things that go along with eating a healthy uh, diet. She also notes that with this medication, she can eat half a bagel and then be fine. And she also seems to imply that that level of appetite and consumption is normal. But I would argue that eating half a bagel and being full and not wanting to eat more is under consumption. For most normal people, half a bagel is not a serving size that is going to provide any level of satiety. And so it seems like this medication is not a way around that regimented diet and exercise program that's going to take over most of your life. It's just a tool that's going to help you stick to it. This idea that the diet is still necessary is really reinforced when Oprah interviews the CEO of Weight Watchers. Now, she notes that they have a comprehensive program that works, that's awesome, that's great for everybody, and that the reason why some people don't lose weight on it is because their biology was wrong. And now that they have these medications as a part of the Weight Watchers program, they can fix people's biology so that they can stick to the Weight Watchers program but you still have to do the Weight Watchers program. So what happens if you're somebody who doesn't have the energy or the time to hike or run five miles a day and do strength training and do a regimented diet program and all of that stuff? What can you expect when you take these medications? 
So based on the data from seven different clinical trials on this medication, the average weight loss that was experienced was about four kilograms or roughly nine pounds. Now, in another study that took place over 104 weeks, it showed that the average weight loss was about 12.6% of their total body weight. So to put that into some numbers for somebody weighing 300 pounds, that would be about a 38 pound loss. But these are all in clinical trials, which is a much more controlled environment than people who are in the free living population. So what are the results of people who are prescribed this by their doctor and then sent out into their regular lives? One study in Italy that followed people for a year after being prescribed this medication showed that the average weight loss was 3.6 kilograms or or about eight pounds. And based on the average weight of participants, that would represent about a 3.5% drop in weight. And this study was funded by the pharmaceutical companies. Another study done in a free living population in the UK, which followed almost 600 people for two years, showed that the average weight loss over the two years was about 11 and a half pounds. Also important to note that this study showed that 65% of people stopped taking the medication by two years. So even in the clinical trials, which is the best case scenario, the weight loss that's achieved is nowhere near the weight loss that is being promoted in in this Oprah's weight loss special. And in a free living population, the studies show that weight loss is even less dramatic. When you're approaching the question of does Ozempic treat obesity, would the weight loss that you're expecting to see bring someone from the obese range to the non-obese range? And so again, if we're looking at a 300 pound person, if they were going to lose the amount of weight that was seen in the clinical trials, that would bring them from 300 pounds to 262 pounds, which would still be classified as obese. So overall, the effects that are being promoted by this special are massively overstated compared to what we could expect based on free living and clinical trials. It's also important to note that these medications do have side effects, mostly nausea, vomiting, GI distress, those sorts of things, with the percentage of people experiencing these symptoms ranging anywhere from 48% to 82%. Now, the doctors interviewed in the Oprah special say, yeah, but these symptoms are mild to moderate. And to that, I have to respond, well, how big of an impact would moderate nausea have on your life? I would say it would be a pretty big impact on your life. Even mild nausea would have a big impact on your life. And that's probably one of the reasons why people don't continue taking these medications for a long period of time. And even in the Oprah special, they share that 17% of people reported that they stopped the medication due to the side effects, which is actually a pretty large dropout rate. So why did Oprah make this special? Because essentially what this is, is an Ozempic commercial that's trying to tell you, hey, you can avoid the shame and guilt associated with being in a larger body size by just taking this medication that's going to fix the problem for you. I think the reason why she made this special is to try to shift public opinion to believing that obesity is a disease. Because if obesity is a disease, then the medications to treat the disease will be covered by insurance. Outside of GI symptoms, the other major reason why people stop taking Ozempic is the cost. And how expensive this medication is, if you're paying out of pocket, is really a sticking point in this special. So the doctors interviewed mentioned that lack of insurance coverage is really limiting access to these medications. The child and her mother who are interviewed say that they could be on a better version of this medication if insurance would only cover it, but buying it is financially prohibitive. And then they also interview representatives from Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk, the producers of these medications, who say that the main reason why it is so expensive out of pocket is because insurance companies aren't covering it. And in order for insurance companies to get on board with this medication, then obesity has to be classified as a disease. And of course, the heads of these pharmaceutical companies would really, really want that to happen because currently 73% of the U.S. population is classified as overweight or obese, and all of which would suddenly have access to this medication through insurance. But it's a huge falsehood that the reason why this medication is so expensive is because insurance won't cover it, because a recent study showed that it actually only takes about $5 in order to produce a month's supply of Ozempic. The amount of profit that's going to the pharmaceutical companies for every single month that somebody's on one of these medications is immense. Imagine if 73% of the population were on it, and this is a medication you have to continue taking for life in order to continue to have the weight loss benefits. In light of all of this, the production of this special by Oprah feels really disgusting. She is trying to convince people that their struggle with weight is actually a disease that needs to be treated through a medication that you have to take for life, and that through taking this medication and losing weight, you'll suddenly not feel guilty or have shame anymore and your life will be so much better. When you boil it all down, it's really a grifty commercial. Now, I have had clients who have taken this medication who have not experienced side effects who have actually really enjoyed their experience and have seen real benefit. So I don't think that there is no place for this medication. And so if that feels like a really good route for you, by all means, you can try it and use it as a tool. But I also think you shouldn't watch this special and go, oh my gosh, I could suddenly live in a thin body just by taking this medication. All I have to do is shovel tons of money into this pharmaceutical company in order to achieve it because the likelihood is you're you're probably actually not going to lose that much weight. The reason why I made this video is not to say that Ozempic is bad, to say that it's not a good tool. It's to say that the way that Oprah is presenting it is very disingenuous. So if you're considering this medication, just really try to go about it with both eyes wide open.